From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. The midterm elections 2022 are in the books, although some races are still being tabulated with mail-in votes still coming in. We do know the results in some key contests. It's been called one of the most consequential midterm elections in modern American history. In this episode of Straight Talk, we bring back our election night analysts to get their big takeaways. Welcome once again to Rebecca Tweed, a consultant and strategist who's worked with a number of Republican candidates. She's joined joining us via Zoom, and Multnomah County Commissioner Sushila Jayapal, who served as our Democratic Election Night Analyst, and she is here in the studio. Thank you for joining us. It's nice Good to, to have here. you both here. And we should note right off the top that we are taping this on Thursday afternoon. Things are fluid, so things could change by the time this airs. But let's start with how you would describe this election. What is your big takeaway? Let me begin with the Commissioner. Yeah, well, I have a couple, Laurel. Um, the first is we went into this election with it being positioned as a referendum, right? A referendum on the party in power at the national level, a referendum at the party in power at the state level, a referendum on incumbents. And I think what we've seen is that voters took a much more nuanced approach to it. They really saw themselves as making a choice based on the specific candidates and the issues that they were voting on. And the second takeaway I have is um, you know, the Democrats ran both on the day to day issues, inflation, safety, houselessness that people are concerned about, but also ran on values, ran on civil rights, ran on abortion rights, took some criticism about that from their own party. Um, but I think what we see is that that was ultimately what voters were interested in and how they voted. Well, let's turn to Rebecca Tweed, our Republican strategist. And what's your big takeaways? Yeah, big takeaways for me on election night were, you know, there were a lot of assumptions made uh, on how Republicans might do based on historical trends, based on polling data that showed these races were, were closer. And I think the takeaway really is that Oregon tends to be, you know, pretty traditional in the way that they vote. We had some exciting candidates. We made history with the most number of women that have ever run. We're actually the first state to ever have three women candidates for governor running. So historical in some ways. In other ways, I think voters went home to where you know their party is and, and stuck to those issues and really felt like they were going to vote where they were comfortable. Um, you know, there are still a number of races that are really close, and I think there's some reasons for that, some of the you know, closer to Portland campaigns. Um, but you know, the assumption that there would be a red wave, a lot of people didn't think that was realistic in Oregon. I think there was some headway made towards Republicans getting elected. Uh, but not quite as much as people had expected or assumed. Well, let's dig deeper into that history-making governor's race that you mentioned, Rebecca. The Oregonian and OPB projecting Democrat Tina Kotek has edged out Republican Christine Drazen. AP, is, as of Thursday afternoon, has not called it. It's just a small percentage separating Drazen and Kotek. And Drazen, as of now, has not conceded. Unaffiliated candidate Betsy Johnson was a distant third. Kotek held a news conference earlier Thursday and declared victory, saying she would be a governor for all Oregonians. Here's part of what she said. When I start as your next governor, I will focus on three things first. I will declare a homeless in a state of emergency and work with urgency to help Oregonians move off the streets. I will expand access to mental health and addiction treatment services. And I will work to bridge the divisions in our state. I'll spend time in communities all over Oregon working to fix problems and partner with Oregonians who want to find solutions. Let me ask you, Commissioner, this was a tough race for Tina Kotek. You and I talked, you said she had the, the tougher message. She had a lot of headwinds. She, she had the faltering economy. She had an unpopular Democratic governor that she was following, that she worked with. She had homelessness, rising crime in Portland, all the issues that Portland's facing. They brought in some heavy hitters, as you've seen here in some of the video. We had President Joe Biden come in. We had Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren come in to try to shore support up for Tina Kotek. They, the Democrats did not want to lose the governor's office for the first time in 40 years in this triumvirate of states, Washington, Oregon, and California. In the end, Commissioner, what do you think put Tina Kotek over the edge and gave her this victory? 
Well, I think we heard a little bit of it on that clip that you just played. Um, I think she ran a really substantive race, right? She talked about the issues. She laid out her plans for how she would resolve those issues. She distinguished herself from the from Governor Brown, who, as you mentioned, is has been unpopular. Um, and she didn't shy away from some of those big picture issues. She put abortion front and center as well. And so I think those were the things that ultimately um, brought it home for her. And, you know, we, we, sh we Democrats have an advantage in terms of numbers, but she needed to be able to speak to independents. And I think with that very substantive, um, I'm going to tackle the issues, I am going to bring a level of competence to state government that everybody wants to see, I think those were the messages that resonated. And one of the things she talked about recently was about homelessness, and she said that she would immediately work with Mayor Wheeler and also the new county chair, who is Jessica Vega-Peterson, the chair-elect who will follow Deborah Kafori, who is term-limited. Are you encouraged that with Tina Kotek as governor, working with the new chair, working with Mayor Wheeler, that there will be some progress made on homelessness? I think that um, collaboration with the state is absolutely essential, right? People focus on their local governments as being res responsible for these issues that they deal with day to day. And the reality is that this is an issue of a magnitude that cannot be solved solely at the local level. It absolutely takes state investment of resources and state investment in really um, working with our local government. So yes, I'm very encouraged uh, because I know that that's gonna be her approach. Well, let's talk about the Republicans. Let's bring Rebecca back in. I mean, this had to be so disappointing for Republicans. I think Republicans really thought this could be their time after 40 years not being in the governor's office in Oregon. and. The condition seemed right for Christine Drazen to win. She did have uh, things that she could talk about, kitchen table issues. She had the homelessness and rising crime in Portland that she could point to. She could point to one party rule for, for so long. She could talk about a high cost of groceries and gas. And But coming so close, and at, at least at this point, looking like it wasn't quite enough. Uh, how disappointing is this for Republicans in Oregon? Well, I think it's been a really interesting race for Republicans for Christine Drazen for a key reason is that she's been one of the more conservative Republicans that we've had run in the last 12 years. You know, Chris Dudley was a moderate, but Pierce was a moderate. You know, Bueller was considered moderate, maybe even too progressive. Christine Drazen really ran on conservative platforms and pretty traditional conservative values and has come closer than anybody has in the last decade or so. There's a few factors that go into it. You know, I think having Betsy Johnson, who may have come in a distant third, but I would say had a successful impact on the race, uh, you know, that impacts it quite a bit. If you look at where the numbers are today, having it be only 60,000 votes apart with some Clackamas County votes still out there. And, you know, Christine Drazen, as usual with Republicans in Oregon, win a majority of the state geographically, but just not some of these key really populated uh, you know, Mid Valley or, or a little bit uh, more urban based counties, you know, I think, of course, there's some disappointment. I think she brought a lot of energy to the campaign uh, and a lot of Republicans felt like they were reflected in there and that there was a path to victory. Um, you know, I think even when there's a losing campaign, uh, you know, as of today, there are still some wins in there. You know, if I was Tina Kotek, I would have been very nervous on election night, right? This was not just a runaway campaign for the party of 40 years uh, and probably is part of why she's coming out ahead right now with a message and, and taking the call for her uh, to be governor. So, you know, there's really, some of those messages really did resonate. And I think it re-energized Republicans across the board. You know, there's been some legislative pickups. I think more Republicans will try to be more engaged and involved. So it's certainly a disappointing night if you were hoping for a Republican governor, but some really good messages there as well. Well, you ran Republican uh, Newt Bueller's campaign in 2018 against Governor Kate Brown. It came very close. And in 2010, Chris Dudley came close to beating Governor Kitzhaber. This was a favorable climate for Drazen to win. Is there a path for a Republican to win the governor's seat in Oregon? I think there's certainly a path. Uh, you know, it takes a couple of years to, to get that message across. This was a baby step towards it. You know, Newt Bueller had a great campaign. And I'm not saying that just because I was involved in it, you know, really started some of that message. It'll take a few years for that to really resonate. And I think Tina Kotek has a lot that she needs to be accountable for very, very quickly. 
all the things that she said in her acceptance speech or her acknowledgement of her quote unquote win right now are all things she could have done as Speaker of the House as well. So how is it different now than it was when she was in the legislature? I think Oregonians will be watching her very quickly and Republicans, you know, will need to pay attention to that as well and pay attention to the message and and how you really resonate with voters. I, I do think one thing Republicans do need to do better is they have to have a message that resonates with all Oregonians when they run campaigns. Betsy pulled some of those votes. Some folks went to Tina Kotak because they're comfortable. Republicans need to be able to talk to everybody and that's going to take some time. Well, so no change in the governor's office, at least the way it looks today on Thursday afternoon. Democrats hold on to the seat. But in Portland, voters did opt for change. Voters chose newcomer Renee Gonzalez over incumbent Joanne Hardesty for city council. She was elected in 2018. Gonzalez ran on a platform promising to reduce crime and homelessness. And voters also approved the measure to overhaul Portland City Hall. And here's what the new system would do. or getting rid of the commission form of system and create a city council with 12 members instead of five. Three apiece will come from four districts in the city. And the mayor will become more of an administrator working with a newly hired city manager who will oversee bureaus. And there will also be ranked choice voting. Let's listen to what administrators say will happen next. To get there, a transition team in my office will implement changes that include working with Multnomah County to set up ranked choice voting and educating Portlanders about that new way of electing officials. Making sure that the city's business can get done and gets done well is our highest priority. Portlanders made it loud and clear. There is no time to wait. And this all needs to be in place by the November 2024 election. I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Jayapal about this, this new system. You're going to have a new chair in Jessica Vega Peterson that mentioned earlier uh, beating Sharon Myron, who's a, also a fellow commissioner. How is this new, in your view, this new form of government for Portland going to interface with the county commissioner and your board of commissioners? I think it's going to be really interesting. You know, a challenge for for both the city and the county has been that we have very different forms of government, right? We have a county chair that has executive authority that can make things happen, execute, and the city has not had that. The city has had this divided executive responsibility with different commissioners responsible for different bureaus. When we have that executive authority concentrated in the mayor for the city and in the chair for the county, I think it's going to be a lot easier for our governments to work with each other rather than having to talk to a different commissioner depending on which issue we are dealing with. So I, I think it's really promising. Um, I think there absolutely has to be collaboration between the city and the county to solve these problems. And I do think we're on a path to seeing that happen. And we mentioned homelessness. Do you think it'll be easier to work together on that issue? That issue is going to be difficult no matter who's in office and no matter what your structure of government is. But I do think, again, this change in structure makes it easier for these two governments to work together. And real quickly, you know, I want to go back to something we talked about on Tuesday, Laurel, which was the coalition that made this charter change happen, coalition of grassroots organizations coming out of communities of color, kind of a new coalition, really rebutting the feeling from some folks that this was too much change and saying we need substantial change in order to have our voices represented. We can't just tinker at the margins. We need substantial change. And I think the voters agreed. Resonated with them it and resonated. all that grassroots efforts paid off in that case. Let's turn to the congressional races. And usually Oregon doesn't get a lot of attention on election night nationally. But this year we found ourselves being a battleground state with at least two congressional races very close. Again, these races have not been called. They could impact the balance of power in Congress. A number of um, seats have not been called across the country. Here's a look at our latest numbers from Congressional District 5, where Republican Lori Chavez Dreamer maintains a lead over Democrat Jamie McLeod Skinner. This is the district currently held by Kurt Schrader, seven term incumbent who McLeod Skinner beat in the primary. And in the newly created sixth district, what election monitors called a toss up race, Democrat Andrea Salinas topping Republican Mike Erickson. And over in uh, District 4 also, uh, where Val Hoyle was declared the winner over Alex Scarlatos. That's the, the seat held right now by Peter DeFazio, who is retiring. So we know at least one more woman is joining the congressional delegation, and another woman will eventually join from the 5th District, because two women running there. So, Rebecca, I mean, we have 
three, maybe four women joining the congressional delegation, possibly another Republican joining Republican Cliff Bentz in the second district. I mean, a lot of change. Uh, talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the congressional races. Yeah, I mean, again, really exciting to have some new voices that will be going to D.C. for us. And, you know, what's also interesting about this cycle is all three of those congressional races we just talked about, you know, seats four, five and six are essentially brand new, completely open seats, which automatically makes them more competitive. You know, with Peter DeFazio retiring, you know, CD5 with Kurt Schrader losing and how it's been redistricted. And then CD6 is a brand new seat. First time in 40 years, we've added an electoral vote and added a new congressional district. So each of these candidates really had a difficult time trying to reach voters without being incumbent. Some had a small amount of name recognition from being near the area or living in the area, but they really had to start from scratch and, and work really hard to reach voters. I'm not surprised that all these races are close. Um, it'll be interesting to see what those outcomes are, but I do think it's a great time for Oregon to have some new representation in Washington, D.C., whether the Republican or the Democrat wins uh, in the close races you mentioned. It's a nice time for Oregon to get a different voice and, and bring some different perspectives, but pe voters will be watching them very closely. Again, brand new seats, brand new leaders. Voters remember that pretty quickly, and they have to run every two years. Well, Commissioner, we could have up to two thirds of our delegation, the House delegation being women. Well, let's talk just briefly about the role of women in politics. More women candidates than ever were running. What do you think about the progress that women have made into leadership roles in the state of Oregon? I think it's really been incredible, um, you know, and it's not just something that happened in the last couple of years. It's been something that's been built up over time. Um, we can think about Governor Barbara Roberts, right, early for her time. I think at the time there were only three women governors in the country. So this is something that Oregon has been working on and we're seeing the progress. I will say, as I said on Tuesday night, that especially in terms of our state legislature and some of our other uh, sort of more local political offices, the question of legislator pay is one that we really have to address. Our legislature is not paid. In general, women have less access to money and wealth than, than men do. Um, and if we want to see this trajectory continue, I think we're going to have to address that issue. And we mentioned that a number of legislators decided not to run again because of the pay issue. So maybe the legislature will take it up again. Well, it's time for us to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the role of money in this year's midterm elections, and we'll look at the balance of power in the Oregon legislature. We're back right after the break. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We are breaking down some of the key races and takeaways from the midterm election here in Oregon and Washington. And welcome once again to our election night panelists, our Democratic analysts from the night, Multnomah County Commissioner Sushila Jayapal and Republican strategist Rebecca Tweed. Once again, great to have you both here. Oregon's one of a handful of states with no limits on political contributions, and we saw a lot of money poured into a number of races this election. You all saw the wall-to-wall -wall TV ads, radio spots, mailers in your mailbox, more than 68 million in the governor's race. Rebecca, I think you heard it may be 75 million when all is said and done, including millions of dollars from Nike co-founder Phil Knight, who put in three and three quarters million to Betsy Johnson's campaign, then another million into uh, Christine Drazen's campaign. We saw outside money in the city council and charter amendment races. I mean, what do you make of all that money, Rebecca? Did it make a big difference? How did it compare to past elections? Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, the 2018 gubernatorial election had been the most expensive in Oregon's history, coming in right under 40 million. And as you said, we're at 68 right now. I think by the time more of those expenditures get reported and come in, we'll be at 75 or, or something near that. It's intense, and some of the legislative races have been over a million dollars again. Uh, you know, Oregon likes to spend money on campaigns. I think the gubernatorial race, you know, certainly costs more because we had three really competitive candidates in that race. Uh, really, you know, Betsy Johnson coming out last year and raising millions of dollars early on had to put, you know, Christine Drazen and Tina Kotek on their heels for a number of months to catch up, but remarkable amount of money. By the time you add up what was spent in the election across the state, I, I'm sure that it will be close to $100 million. It's just hard to fathom that in campaigns, but that's what they cost nowadays. 
Well, Commissioner, you still have concerns about the money spent in the primary by the national, a PAC that's tied to the National Democratic Party in the 6th District, which is that newly created district and, and backing Carrick Flynn in the primary who ended up losing and by quite a lot. What are your concerns about that money by the National Dems? Yeah, so if you think back to the primary, which seems forever ago, by the way, you had Carrick Flynn, you also had Andrea Salinas, you had uh, Loretta Smith, former Multnomah County Commissioner, you you had uh, former state rep Teresa Alonso Leon. And so for the Democratic House Majority PAC to come in and back Carrick Flynn, which they typically don't do in a contested primary, um, uh, well, the other candidates were, were upset. They held a news conference. They talked about the fact that they were upset about that national intervention. And I, you know, we'll, we'll see, but, but I think that that really could have had an impact on Andrea Salinas. In other words, that money coming in for Carrick Flynn in the primary meant that she had to spend more money to get her name out. As Rebecca said, everybody's new in that district. They needed to make themselves known. And so I think it really could have cost her. It cost her in the primary, and I think it, it affected her in the general. She ran a terrific race in both pieces of it. Um, but that participation by, by the National Democratic Party, I think, I think they're going to be asking themselves for a while to come as to what kind of impact they had in that race. Is there any recourse for candidates after the, with the National Party? Any, anything they can do? I, I don't think so. <laughs> just to, <laughs> just, just to object. About, just, 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 just object. Just, just keep object. talking about what a problem it was. Well, let's talk about the balance of power in the, in the Oregon legislature, because that's something that Democrats have had a supermajority for a number of years in both the Senate and the House, which means they can push through policy without a single Republican vote. That appears to be changing. Talk a little bit about that, Rebecca. Yeah, well, in the Oregon Senate, you know, there were two Republican pickups, so they broke that supermajority hold there and won very competitive race in the Clackamas area between uh, Senator Bill Kenimer and uh, State Representative Mark Meek. That's going to change the balance of power quite a bit. The House, there are still a number of seats, but they also, you know, Republicans picked up a few. And when you're in a supermajority battle, that's really all it takes is just to pick up one or two or three, depending on how bad the supermajority spread is. And, you know, I think it's a positive thing, uh, regardless of which party's in charge, having supermajority power means you don't have to negotiate, you don't have to have conversations. If you have, you know, a Democrat supermajority and a Democrat governor, then, you know, lawmaking becomes really one sided. And I think, you know, if Tina Kotek remains the projected winner and the House and the Senate uh, require a little bit of negotiation, I think it'll bring back some partnership to the legislature that we've missed in the last few years. Uh, but right now, there are too many seats that are too close to call. Some of these are three or four hundred votes apart. Uh, it's really interesting to watch. I think it's the year that we've had some of the most competitive races to even have a handful that are within three to four hundred votes. Uh, from one another is, is pretty remarkable. We have a little bit of time. I just wanted to go back to money a little bit because we were talking Tuesday night about independent expenditures that we saw in some of the races. What were your concerns there? Well, I think it was interesting to watch the effect of having can campaign contributions at the local level, right? We have campaign contribution limits, I should say. We have limits at the city council level. We have limits at the Multnomah County level. These are fairly recent. And I think what we've seen since the imposition of those limits is that it has brought independent expenditures in. That was not a thing prior to the mm -hmm. contribution limits. The issue, um, there's no perfect answer to how to deal with the, the issue of money in politics, but the issue seems to have become, with these independent expenditures, the messaging has become more negative because candidates aren't responsible for those messages anymore. It has become a little bit less substantive. So I think where, you know, what we need to think about is, it's as Rebecca said, it's always gonna take money to run campaigns. So you can't get money out of politics altogether. The question is who has the money and how are voters able to tell where it's coming from? Right. Exactly. And I could give you about 30 seconds, Rebecca, before uh, we have to wrap things up. Well, I just want to highlight, you know, Betsy Johnson's run for governor, even though she came in a distant third at this stage, it really was still a successful campaign. You know, I think she really brought a message forward that a lot of Oregonians do resonate with, even if they went back to their corners on election night. Uh, I think that's significant. And, you know, the fact that we're even talking about a third party candidate is is serious. And I hope that Tina Kotek and Christine Drazen find a way to work with Betsy uh, going forward. 
But I think it sets the course for some new campaigns we'll see in Oregon, and, and that's exciting. They're all exciting. Well, thank you, Rebecca Tweed and Commissioner Jayapal for joining us. And thank you for watching. Remember, you can get Straight Talk as a podcast. Search for KGW Straight Talk wherever you get your podcasts. Join us next week when we dig into the digital divide and how the city of Portland and Comcast are working together to support low-income households to bridge the digital divide. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.